welcome to Something to Talk About from the Bainbridge Island Senior Community Center. Uh, we are on the ancestral homelands of the Coast Salish people, specifically our neighbors in the Suquamish tribe, and we would like to recognize the people of the Clear Saltwater as hospitable, and we are honored to share their lands and recognize the hurt that has been brought about by our ancestors, and we look to heal that. And part of today's program is certainly with that in mind. I also want to mention that uh, the Something to Talk About programs are sponsored by Fieldstone Communities of Bainbridge Island. To learn about their compassionate care, you can call them. You can also uh, arrange a day stay or respite program tour and information by calling 360-689 4314. We are honored to have uh, Barbara Lawrence from the tribe here with us today and to introduce her and to sort of facilitate our conversation. And Lovejoy will uh, start us off. Hi, Ann. Hey, thanks, Reed. And thank you so much, Barbara, for coming to join us. Um, yeah, I'm really fascinated by your talks because you always weave in so much combination of the history and your personal experiences that really make it so rich and wonderful. And I was hoping today that we could talk a bit about the, the formation of that first original Suquamish Museum, but you've also said you'd be open to questions. And I would love to um, in invite our, our audience to come up with questions. And then when, after you've talked a bit about the museum, they could either put them in the chat or you can raise your hand and call forward, you know, but that sounds like a really rich and, a wonderful conversation as usual. So do you want to just kind of give us a back? I was just thinking about that original museum because I was thinking about how the tribe seemed a lot smaller back then. Were there fewer people or was it just less um, in our public awareness or something? Um, I'm not sure that there was fewer people. I mean, of course, population is, is gaining and, and uh, for the tribe, um, there. I mean, that's a whole that's a whole presentation right there is the population of the tribe. But um, so uh, we we are we're at twelve hundred right now. Our our the tribe's population is at twelve hundred right now, and definitely in nineteen fifty there was one hundred and thirty tribal members. So um, we had we had a we had a lot to make up from the you know genocidal attempts so um you know that just took a left turn there but um uh so we're we're trying to um raise and stabilize our population you know and scary things like the pandemic happens you we remember we remember um the not long ago when our population was um, precarious i'm not gonna know what the population was in 1983 when we opened the first museum <clears throat> but i could say that we had um we had a lot less publicity we had a lot less um caring neighbors you know we had a lot less going on for um for people to hear about and see back in 1983 although it was every every um every decade every program every new thing was always pretty thrilling for us yeah i can imagine because you've made such enormous strides as a tribe just in the last 30 or 40 years it seems like mm -hmm. but it was 83 when that museum got started the very first one do, do, we opened the doors on june 1st 1983 and you were part of putting that whole thing together, weren't you? I was one of the team members. And um, so before we opened the doors, I was a research assistant, oral historian, and um, staff member. Um, when we opened the doors, I became a tour guide. And, um, and I say that with a whole lot of pride. I, I don't know if people, what people think about tour guides, but to me, I was introducing us and our great history to the world, to any one single person or any group that walked in the doors, I was, I was ready. I wasn't the only one. There was, there was two, and we were open seven days a week. And um, we were open till 
eight o'clock at night. So, so there was, um, there was, there was numerous staff that kept the cultural center and the museum going, and I was one of them. To talk about how the museum opened, how it came to be in existence, we have to go back <clears throat> to um, 1976 to the United States bicentennial. During the bicentennial year, <clears throat> the United States was offering through, the, through HUD, um, housing and urban development, community, de community development grants. These grants were open to tribes to build um, capital projects that would improve you know, life and you know, daily life for, for tribes. And so we applied and we got the funds and we began construction in 1976 late 76, early 77. And um, it was built on this property where I'm at right now, um, Sandy Hook, and um, which was land that belonged to an individual tribal member. And the tribe actually bought it from the individual tribal member for this, for this um, Suquamish Tribal Center. Um, we had an architect, and I'm not gonna know who, right now design it um, to be like a contemporary version of a longhouse infused with that northwest coast um, or I should say northwest architecture contemporary architecture and the flavor of the longhouse and um, we knew we needed certain things to um, for the tribe to be um, happy and healthy in it. We wanted an institutional kitchen so that we could have elders meals and community gatherings with food. And we knew we needed a gymnasium. And of course we needed offices for staff, for the, for the tribal government staff. We also <clears throat> needed, um, we wanted a library and a cultural center. Um, there wasn't a plan for the museum in that original building. So the building was going up and it was exciting and it was about three quarters done. The second floor was going to be the library and the um, cultural research center. It was about three quarters done when um, a fire brought it to the ground. There, there was actually a parking lot, an asphalt parking lot, and um, which seemed huge to me at the time. And on the um, parking lot was spray painted racial slurs and um, that with the, um, you know, fire um, investigators um, determined that it was arson. So um, while it was insured, when you start over, when you clean up the, the debris from, from a fire like that, and then begin your rebuild, um, even if it was 100% insured, the money didn't go as far. So the top floor was left empty. In fact, they didn't even put a floor. It, it was, um, the downstairs had high vaulted ceilings so that there wasn't even, um, there wasn't even the funds for the library or the cultural research center upstairs. So they just left it high vaulted ceilings downstairs. So it was impressive downstairs building, but the dream for the library and the cultural resource center, research center upstairs was still there. It took a few years. So between 1978, when the Suquamish Tribal Center was complete, and um, 1983, when we opened the museum, the first museum, there were more than one plan um, floated for the top floor. Um, the, we were in several lawsuits, um, whether we were trying to build housing projects, low-income housing projects, and then being taken to court by the neighbors who didn't want it, or um, the Tidelands lawsuit where um, 
you know, people in the tribe would be clam digging on usual on the custom grounds and the waterfront landowners would chase people off with guns. Or, um, you know, the bolt decision hadn't happened yet. So things like that. When um, And even when the bolt decision happened, there were still numerous lawsuits after that and still some are ongoing um, for uh, clarification of different um, aspects of it. And so, and so there was reasons that um, the tribal council and the chairman of the tribe at that time for part of that time was um, Lawrence Webster, who was one of our, one of our revered elders, who was born in the, um, the Suckweb Longhouse and was a little child in the, the Suckweb Longhouse before it was um, burned to the ground by the military. He and the tribal council and leaders of the tribe thought that instead of a library, then a museum would be needed and important so that education to the public could happen. Since we were in um, seemingly continuous legal battles, um, just trying to survive, the thought of having a museum to educate the public would um, be better money spent than having a library. So <clears throat> they um, got a loan from a bank, which was, it was always scary <clears throat> because what we always have to use as, <clears throat> as um, collateral is land because that's all we have, you know? And then land is so precious to us that, um, that it's always this big, oh my gosh, you know? Now the, the plans, of course you have to get um, 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 consultants. You have to get consultants in and they have to draw up some plans and they have to say the, um, the you know, <clears throat> possible return on investment and, you know, all their suggestions were that um, a museum would actually make money. It would support itself. The truth is um, museums don't support themselves. You know, all, most museums are, are run by tax dollars. Um, and so for, for Ours wouldn't be run by tax dollars. It would be built by a loan from a bank and supported by the tribal government in however we could. We did charge admission. And, um, and so one, one weekend when I was working, a gentleman came in and um, he opened the door and you know, right straight across from the front door was the, the desk, the front desk. And, and he said, why should I pay $3.50 to come in here? Museums are supposed to be free. And I explained, you know, most museums are operated by tax dollars. This one isn't. We're doing this on our own and um, it, needs to, it needs to help support itself. So let me offer you this. Please come in. Please go through the exhibit. And if you don't think it was worth $3.50, you don't have to pay. And so he... Um, <laughs> He did. He came in, he stayed for two hours, he read everything, he asked lots of questions. We had, we had a slide tape show that lasted 15 minutes where you could hear the elders' voices and see their faces and, and, um, <clears throat> and it, was, it was wonderful. And he paid his $350 and he made a donation and he left saying that he was going to tell everybody to come and see it. So we made friends. Um, and I tell people that Museums aren't supposed to make money. They're supposed to um, make friends. We're, we're supposed to uh, make allies, give out education and bring in friends and, and allies. And so that's what we were doing. Now, in building that, in building that unused attic space into a museum, it took um, us squeezing pennies like three ways and becoming very, very creative with the exhibit. 
we had lots of oral history. Uh, there was 10 of us for a good couple of years that were out sent out with at that time, this was in the 70s, um, top of the line tape recorders and little microphones and we would go to elders homes and get them to talk about their life stories. And almost every single one would say, <clears throat> my life isn't important. I don't, my, it's not very interesting. I don't, you don't even have to turn that tape recorder on. I could just tell you my story in about five minutes. And so we'd always have to prod them along with, um, were you in boarding school? Did you go to the um, public school? Did you grow up in the reservation or somewhere else? You know, and then look around and see photos in their home and say, who's in that picture? Is that your grandma? Is that a basket? Is she a basket weaver? Something to get them to start talking. And then we found out by accident really that the photographs were the way in. So we wrote, so that there was a grant for the oral history project. And then we wrote another grant for the photo archives project because once we got them talking about those photos, which got them talking about the people in the photos, which got them talking about basketry or canoe carving or clam digging or fishing or you know boarding school, the language, any of the thousands of topics, um, the photos became very, very important. So we would, um, in that, in that, um, before the museum was built, a dark, a dark room was built in, in the top floor and a tribal member and a, and a grad student from the University of Washington were hired to um, copy photos from the tribal members, from their photo albums, from off their walls, and, um, and we amassed, I want to say, oh, 10,000 photo images from tribal members and from families of settlers and from um, other, other agencies and institutions like the Burke Museum, Kitsap County Historical Society. Um, I know there's others that I'm forgetting who were generous with with their support, but really, we had um, we had a lot of oral history and photos. So we made the photos huge, just absolutely giant on the walls. Painted all the walls black. Made all the the photos big, giant, bigger than posters. Huge, giant photos on um, on that were on plywood that were hung on the walls, and then. Um, giant um, quotes from the elders from the oral history throughout the exhibit. And then the very few artifacts that we owned ourselves from that the tribe owned or from the community, our own tribal community that were lent to us. And then, um, and then we borrowed a lot of artifacts from the Burke Museum, the, his, the history of um, industry, the history, the Museum of History and Industry in Seattle and um, Kitsap County Historical Society and then some non-Indians who were generous with artifacts that they had. So we, um, so we put it together that way and, um, and we focused on the title of the premier exhibit was The Eyes of Chief Seattle. So we are looking from the treaty time forward. And, um, and focused on a, a big section of that exhibit was about boarding school because we, our elders who were alive, the oldest people we had in the tribe in the 70s and 80s were um, survivors of the boarding school, boarding, multiple boarding schools. Um, so, we, um, so their memories were, were right there about the boarding school time. Um, we also had um, veterans, lots of veterans from World War II and the Korean War. And, um, and so we focused a lot on that. And we also focused on um, the, um, our connection to our, our land and water, mainly with our, as our food source. And why the connection was so strong to our, to our land and water was 
no matter what came, no matter what tragedy happened to us as a people, we could always go get food. You know, we could always get, we could always get clams 365 days a year. Now that was something that we were proud to say back then that you couldn't start, Indians wouldn't starve. We could always get clams. We could always get, um, well, clams 365 days a year we could get fish a lot of the time. And then um, berries, roots and shoots and, you know, um, red meat you know, hunters and all that, but, um, but we could count on clams. Never did I think back then, I never, the thought never crossed my mind or anybody else's that clams and oysters, shellfish would ever be in danger like they are now with um, ocean acidification. So that's terrifying now. It's absolutely terrifying now to know that something that we, we knew without a doubt that we would always have, we might not have because of climate change and ocean acidification and what we're doing to it. So I know last summer there was that terrible heat wave and there were low, classic low tides and there was so much loss that I don't think has come back, has it? Yeah, that was, that was a tragedy. <clears throat> that was a tragedy. You know, we always have those those extreme low tides. Those were annual happening, but it didn't annually happen with the heat wave. So, um, so that was that was that was a terrible time. And yeah, I haven't. I know at the I know at the time that it was happening, the biologists and our tribal leaders were were, you know, feeding us the information about how devastating this was. You know, it's really, it just makes you um, know that the reason why Native people had potlatches and would invite the other tribes around to come to celebrate with us, whatever the occasion was to celebrate, the reason we were celebrating, somebody was getting married or somebody was having a naming ceremony or whatever the celebration was, we would invite the tribes around to come to us and celebrate and everyone would be fed for the number of days and nights. They would have the best place to sleep, the best food. They would go home with gifts. They would just, you know, we would do this and all these tribes would do this and the, the Coast Salish people all did these potlatches. The reason we did this was because we knew that there would there would always be bad times. There will always be bad times. And when there are bad times, you need your, you need your allies, you need your friends and your relatives. So that when you're having our, this village is having a terrible time. One of those others that was our guest before would remember that we were generous to them and they would be generous to us. So, so it was, I know it was viewed differently by non-Indians who wrote about it, saying that that we were unashamedly um, throwing wealth around. It's not what it was. It was it wasn't that. It was it was when we had enough to share, we shared on purpose and strategically, so that when there was hard times, which there would always be hard times. Um, I mean, not always. We would know that there was going to be hard times whenever we least expected it, but we could always expect the people that we were generous with to be generous to us when we needed it, and we would do the same. So, um, <clears throat> so that's, that, and you know today, um, and for however many years now, I should know this. I should know how many years there's this there's this um, agency, this nonprofit agency called the Potlatch Foundation, and they um, it was it was this one um, Native woman's um, idea that you know here we're having these canoe journeys and these tribes that can afford it 
can um, have a canoe carved and outfit their youth and have, um, have the chase boats ready to go with them and have the ground crew to follow in bands, you know, and, and go on these journeys for, you know, two weeks or a month or whatever. But the tribes that don't, that can't afford it, just can't afford it. So her idea was to start a, you know, because there's, there's all these foundations out there that you can write grants to and get help from, but, and, and right now, in today's time, there's some tribes that can't afford to put in with each other and have this potlatch fund. So that, so, so, so she created that. And, um, and it exists and it's doing really well. So the tribes that have money put into the potlatch fund and the tribes that need money get get from the potlatch fund. And um, it's, now it's, it's bigger than it used to be and it's not just for canoe journey. It's for, it's for lots of things. So, um, so we're still doing the potlatch in today's times, in today's ways, you know. And we're still doing it in the old fashioned way too. We still do ceremonies and celebrations where we invite lots of people and we give them lots of gifts and, and um, handmade things and things that we have in abundance. So um, back to the museum that, um, that we built one of the, because when you're talking about an attic, there's gonna be odd shaped ceilings and there's gonna be it's going to go like it was like in an S shape. And so we saved the last room that people would go into. We, we made it like a room in a longhouse. And, um, and we hung, we had some sand in an area with, um, with shells and had some smoked salmon hanging up. So it was actual smoked salmon. And I remember going and getting the buckets of sand and, and, um, you know, creating that, that ambiance of, of a longhouse, a piece of a longhouse at a beach. And the children just loved it. It was a great place for kids to watch a video um, or the slide tape show that eventually became a video that then became a DVD. And so, um, so that, little, that little place, that last room was where we would have the, the, um, the 10 minute movies that that classrooms would enjoy. One of those was Hey Oost Nuchen. You can say that. Hey Oost Nuchen. Come on, you guys. Hey Oost Nuchen. Hey Oost Nuchen. Hey Oost Nuchen. Hey Oost Nuchen. There you go. So you just <laughs> said, come forth laughing. Nice. You just said, come forth laughing in La Chute. And, um, and so the, our first little 10 minute slide tape show that then became a video that then became a DVD is Hey Oost Nuchen, Come Forth Laughing. And it was all um, the oral history of, it was completely narrated by oral history that, that we did with our elders. And, um, and the first voice was Clara Jones, who her maiden, her maiden name, um, her maiden name was Saigo, I think, I think. And um, she was talking about when she was little, they used to play a game at the beach where you, um, they have kids on this side and kids on this side, and they're a ways apart, and they each have a stick in the sand in front of them, and they have one big clam shell, like a, like a gooey duck shell or a, or a horse clam shell balanced on their stick. And the kids on this side, had to run over to that side, grab the shell, one, one kid at a time, grab the shell and come back and put it on their stick without smiling or, or laughing. And the kids on that side had to do everything to make them laugh. Now that game, it was, it was a fun game. There was physical activity, there was goofiness and all that, but it was a very serious game in that back then, you know, and for thousands of years, when you live in a longhouse, you had to teach the kids to control their emotions. You had to teach the littlest, littlest, littlest ones to control their emotions because if the um, enemies showed up, 
to attack us, the, all the able-bodied men and women would get in the canoes and try to keep the battle on the water. And the elders would take the littlest children or all the children and, and run out into the, um, into the woods behind the longhouse and toss kids into um, sticker bushes, blackberry bushes in there. And kids would just burrow down like little bunny rabbits go in there and not cry out in pain because of the sticker bushes, not cry out for being afraid or for any reason whatsoever, just go in there and hide and, um, and stay there and stay quiet. Now, if the enemy were able to get on the land, they would know the kids are out there hiding. They know because they all did the same thing and they would take their canoe paddles and poke them in the bushes. And if they poked a kid and a kid cried out, then they would get that kid, you know, and take them back as a slave. Well, so these, these kids were taught to control their emotions under any circumstances. So hate loose Newton is a fun game and my kids played it and my grandkids played it and my grandparents played it. I played it. Um, but the thing is, is that it's a serious game to control your emotions, to teach you to do that in, in case, you know, in case you need to. And I would say that we still need to, we still need. And while I'm, I smile every day, all the time. And I know there's always reasons to make friends. Sometimes I'm in places where I need to control my emotions, you know, with people who don't have the same worldview or, you know, like our former president. I wouldn't be comfortable in situations with um, people who all believed in that former president. And so I would have to control my emotions. Barbara, that brings a question for me, which is one I've, I think I might have asked you before, but how is it that the Suquamish people are so unfailingly courteous and polite? And maybe you've just touched on that in the face of some really uncourteous and unpolite uh, conversations and activities. I've yeah. just been amazed at the strength of character um, that I've seen. Um, I think that it's definitely a, a character trait of us that there's there's things that we were taught for thousands of years that were important to be to 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 make more friends and enemies to be generous to be hospitable these are all things that are like absolutely Suquamish and and I have friends in lots of tribes around us and and they would they would say, you guys are too nice to white people. And, and, uh, and, and say, you guys are just too nice. You know, and I, and I would say, yeah, well, um, we have more allies than enemies. And, and it doesn't mean that we won't sue the Navy for scraping its, um, it's poisonous paint off of their ships into Puget Sound. It doesn't mean that we won't do that. We will, and we'll do it every time, and we've done it more than once. We also will build that relationship with the Navy so much so that every canoe journey, those Navy guys are here to help carry those canoes up and down the beach. It, but we still will enforce the law the way that we have to when they disregard it, you know? Um, so, and I would say that Chief Seattle and Chief Chalicum before him, Chief Kitsap, all of them, I would say that they were, they were interested in having more friends than enemies, but they were also willing to go to war when it was necessary. And hopefully not. Even when they went to battle, even when they went to battle, there would be a time where the canoes, because you always want the battle on the water. It, unless you're winning, <laughs> unless you're winning, you want the battle on the water. If you're winning, you want to get all the way to their shore and, you know. But, um, but before the battle happens, the, the canoes are there and the leadership, the canoes are there and the leadership 
approach each other and say, so we don't have to do this. You know, five of my um, leaders' daughters can marry five of your sons and we could all be relatives, you know. Um, and that would happen sometimes and sometimes it wouldn't happen. Couple things, um, Reed posted the Come Forth Laughing, a, a link to that YouTube on the on the um, chat. So if you wanna copy it or look at that, you could do that. But also a question came up of um, how has the work to create the first museum changed the tribe? What would you say? So I would say that um, there was a whole lot of thought and effort to go into that oral history and photo archives, but also um, that's the main topics being boarding school and and um, our tie to our land and water and our, our tie to them because of food, because of resources. Um, this, the museum, because the truth wasn't taught in schools, and, and I, I, have an, I, have a, I have a job that helps bring more truth to schools, but it's not 100%, it's not all the time, it's not, we're just barely getting there. We considered the Suquamish Museum, the first one and the second one, an education, a truly educational facility for, um, for our non-Indian neighbors and friends, you know, that we, we must teach about us because the others aren't teaching about us. So, so for a, a county historical society, they might think that the staff are volunteers, you know, just get some retired folks to come in and be the volunteers, you know, and, and that's fine for a Kitsap Historical Society, you know, but for tribal, for any tribal museum, of which there were very few, Suquamish Museum was the third native operated museum in the state of Washington. Um, the first one was the Yakima and the second one was the Macaw, and both of them were huge in helping us shape ours. We needed their expertise and experience to shape ours. We also had built that relationship with those other non-Indian institutions, the Burke Museum, not just the Burke Museum, but the University of Washington, you know, the, the different departments in the University of Washington that were generous to us because we built those relationships. And the Seattle Art Museum and the Museum of History and Industry and Kitsap County Host Historical Society and the Washington State Museum in Tacoma, um, all of which were all of which were very generous to us because we built those relationships. Now, I would say that um, there are some people that just aren't gonna aren't gonna listen. They are not gonna take an hour out of their day to come through and pay 350 or whatever it is and and um try to learn with those people you just have to wait you just have to wait you just have to wait till they die or retire or you have to wait till you've influenced other people that will influence them so um how has the first museum changed us um i don't know that it's changed us i don't think the first museum changed us i think it changed our neighbors I think it opened the door to the world to Suquamish Museum. One of the, one of the, um, this, this last weekend, I drove down to Olympia and spent a few hours with my friend, Jill Severin. She, she's my dear personal friend. I met her because I was working the weekends in the, in the museum, the first museum. She came in because she saw a newspaper article about it and she worked for the World Affairs Council. The World Affairs Council is a, a branch, a department, an agency of the um, State Department for the United States. And when those people, when the guests of the State Department would fill out a questionnaire and say what they wanted to see when they came to the U.S., almost every one of those um, important delegates would say they want to see real Indians. So if they were coming anywhere close to Seattle, and if Jill had any, um, if she was in charge of what they saw, she, she came to the Suquamish Museum, we met each other, 
Um, I gave her a guided tour. She invited me to her house to dinner. I said, I have three kids and a husband. And she said, bring them along. And so we went over and had dinner. And she said, so I'm having you for dinner because I want to see if you're ready. I, I have opportunity to bring many people from other countries and they're, they're going to be very curious. And so that began our friendship and many, 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 many delegates from groups of delegates from, it might be two, um, it might be two Orthodox, um, Greek Orthodox, let me see. They were from Russia, they spoke Russian, and they were Orthodox. Catholic. Russian Orthodox is what they call themselves. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and um, so there was an interpreter and then them, and I was giving them a tour, and you know, halfway through, I'm not saying wonderful things about the United States government, and they're, and they're like being all shocked, and the interpreter says, they want to know if you have fear for your life. And I said, no, why? And, oh, because you're just talking bad about your country. And I said, oh, no, there's no fear here. There's no fear here. We can say whatever we want about the United States. I'm just telling the truth, you know. And I love my country. And they did these terrible things. And it's the truth. And I love my country. And we hold our country accountable. Um, or it might be Japanese, a whole bunch of Japanese um, people. There, I remember this tour very well. They would ask one question to the interpreter. The interpreter would speak it in English to me. I would answer it. She would speak Japanese to them. And for whatever reason, on this particular tour, there was um, there was um, newspaper photographers and, and um, columnists following them around. And so it got in the newspapers, this tour and lots of photos got in the newspaper. And if you have the opportunity to ride the new Suquamish ferry that goes to Whidbey Island, um, you'll see arts by Suquamish tribal members. You'll also see photographs of me <laughs> when I was like 19 years old and that Japanese tour group um, uh, in one of those tours that were uh, uh, that happened because of our relationship with Jill Severin and the, and the um, World Affairs Council. So I got used to speaking to everybody from every country in all languages, I mean, through a tour, through a translator usually. And, um, and so, yeah, so we, we weren't just uh, changing our direct neighbors, we were, we were influencing the world. And prior to, prior to the um, Suquamish Museum, there were people from around the world who were visiting Chief Seattle's grave, um, carved in the, in the, um, the door frames of, of the United Nations. There's, um, Chief Seattle's words are, quotes from him are above the doorways in the United Nations um, building in Finland. And the only reason I know that is because the Secretary General came in on a tour and told me that so from the United Nations. And so, um, so. Well, that's pretty amazing that this small, seemingly local museum has had such a wide impact. And mm -hmm. you have continued I mean, that sort of fired you off as a historian, didn't it? And then ever since you've been building that part, aren't you, didn't you say you're taking classes even now? Oh, this summer I was, it's over now, but this summer I was at the University of Washington for the Summer Institute in, in, in Indigenous Studies. And so that was, um, that was a um, um, jumpstart on, so what they, so they, the new Burke Museum, had this funding to um, bring in um, 10 people that were either current students or future students of the University of Washington or community members, all native. And it was offered by two native um, PhDs to come to the Burke 
and to learn how to use the resources of the Burke and the University of Washington to um, benefit our, our program, our personal education or our program, which um, that's what I was alluding to earlier is that my, um, my current job at the Suquamish Tribe is, the, um, is helping as a team member, helping to create the Suquamish um, influence into the since time immemorial curriculum that goes into the public schools in the state of Washington. Now, here's another reason to have a relationship with the state is that in this state, we have a law that was passed, I want to say in 2015, that said that the, the state's public schools had to teach the truth about the tribes, the treaties, the history, and contemporary um, realities of the tribes in the state. And so um, assuming that they couldn't just do it just because there was a law, the, this group of people in the Office of Native Education and the Superintendent of Public Instruction in Olympia created many, many lessons, units and lessons for K, for preschool through 12th grade. Um, now, saying that they couldn't create every lesson for every unit, for every grade, for every tribe. So Suquamish so only appears in two lessons of all of the hundreds of lessons. That's okay. Um, the law, as the law states, the school district is to reach out to the tribe, to consult with the tribal council of the tribes that they're nearest to and, um, and create the schools. The school is to create the lessons with the influence from the tribe. I love the teachers at Suquamish Elementary and we had a good couple years of meetings with them and giving, giving information to them and they came up with some lessons that I would say lack um, the Suquamish spirit. They're not bad, they're just not what we would have written. And so we just um, grouped up ourselves just here in the tribe and decided in here, or, you know, in different departments and, and somehow together we have the talent to do this. Um, so we're gonna write all our own lessons and infuse them into the since time and memorial curriculum through Office of Native Education at the superintendent and then out to all the public schools. Um, so we've done one, which you guys know about, and um, we're working on more. So this is what's the reality in Washington state and in several other states, they're passing laws to not teach anything that about racial anything, about, about negative anything, about the, um, I say, I say non-Indians, but I mean Caucasians, white people of the United States. They don't want anything negative taught, anything controversial, anything race-based, anything at all. And those laws are being passed throughout the United States. And I'm just so grateful that Washington State has a law that we are teaching the truth about the tribes. So it does seem like white fragility just is having a little re resurgence, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And I, you know, I just hope it doesn't come to Washington because I'm so grateful that we have since time the memorial and the curriculum that exists. It's, it's really good curriculum. It's well, well done. And we need to put Suquamish into it. Well, I think that what Ruth Bader Ginsburg said that the pendulum always swings, right? And we see that when it swings this way, then we get a little back push, but that, you know, it will swing again and it will swing more. And I keep thinking, I, we have come so far, but we didn't come this far just to come this far. Yeah, right? I, I, I understand about the pendulum, but I want it to balance instead of, instead of going out of whack from one side to the other. I really want it. I really want, I really want that, that balance and that hospitality. I mean, to teach the truth 
doesn't have to be any kind of shame, you know? Um, it doesn't have to be any kind of We can, so there was a study done on South Africa on what happened after, um, after apartheid was ended. And there, the, the study said that because there was such outward acknowledgement that yes, we did this, it was terrible. We'll never do it again, you know? Um, because there was such out and forward and yes, this is, I'm sorry we did this, that, um, that the, um, the aftermath is, is easier. It's much easier. I'm not saying it's easy. And in, um, and in, is it New Zealand? I believe New Zealand has apology day where the um, non-Indigenous people apologize to the Indigenous people. Apology Day is every year and they say it and they mean it, you know. We did these terrible things, we're sorry. And, it, and it's said in a thousand different ways to the Indigenous people, individual to individual, organizations to organizations, they, it's like, it's, they say it. So they're admitting it. And, you know, so it's like in Canada, the truth and reconciliation. Um, I don't know the last word. Commission? Um, truth and Reconciliation Commission? Yes. Um, it, the truth has to be said, acknowledged, accepted, and then. It's better, you know, it's better. As, as long as there's de there's this defense and this rejection and this denial, it's going to be rough. But what is the fear? I'm half white. I know it. You can't look at me and not know it. I'm half white. I was raised by a white mom. Um, I know that if... I personally do something wrong to somebody and if I admit it and say it out loud and then make a serious effort to um, right that wrong, I feel better and they feel better and we can mend that friendship. That's just between two people. It's the same with organizations. It's the same with races classes it's the same it might be a lot, a lot harder work but the benefit is throughout if people would do that i've heard a proposition that we replace columbus day not just with indigenous people's day or native people day but with a day of atonement right yeah it's the same kind of thing and i think that is probably would be really helpful if we could get ourselves to actually do that. Um. So um, we're at 1224. Is there, what, what is our end time? Oh, 1230. And yes, I have one question that I've been um, asked to ask you. Would you, as a tribe, do the Suquamish people prefer that they be called Indians or Native Americans or indigenous to the Northwest? Or is there a different term? Great question. I love this question. Because it's almost every time I offer this, anything you ever wanted to know about Indians but were afraid to ask, almost every time this is the question asked. And I, as an individual, say this, and I heard my elder say this decades ago, I don't care if, and I really don't care if somebody says Indians, Native Americans, American Indians, Indigenous, First People, I don't care about any of those. And when I write and when I speak, I use them all. I throw them all in there. What I want individual non-Indians to do is to, if you know somebody that's a native, know the tribe and know how to say the tribe. When you want to introduce your friend, say, this is my friend Barbara Lawrence from the Suquamish tribe. Because if you say, this is my friend Barbara Lawrence from the Skokomish tribe, 
I would like, no, I'm not Skokomish, no offense to them, but it, it, it's like a huge, huge faux pas not to ever introduce us by the, by the wrong tribe or to mispronounce our name. Inside our culture, if I mispronounce, if I misspell or mispronounce somebody's name or their tribal affiliation, I have to pay them money. So, so what I want people to know is none of those bother me. None of those titles bother me. I don't favor anyone over the other. I say go the extra mile and learn your friend's name of their tribe or the tribe that lives by you or, you know, the three tribes of your three friends or whatever. Know their name of the tribes and know how to say it. That's way more important than indigenous people, Native American, American Indian, first people, you know. I think that that could really present a problem for some people because I know people who've lived here for 70 years and still can't say Puyallup. But totally great point, yeah. <laughs> right? Um, another question we had was, um, what does it really mean to be a sovereign nation? Do Suquamish people pay taxes? like everybody else that might be a double we pay, question we pay all the taxes the only tax we don't pay is um we don't pay tax on our land right if if we have reservation land we don't pay taxes on our land and we don't pay um state or local sales tax anything bought on the reservation or delivered to the reservation we don't pay state or local taxes on that but we pay all the other taxes, all of them. Income tax, it's out of my every paycheck that I get and I work for the tribe and, um, and I work on the reservation, but I pay income tax. So, um, and none of us complain about that. We don't pay, we don't pay, um, we don't pay state and local taxes because all the land that was our land, that was our original territory, and not just land, our water, our, as much, there's, there's a significant amount of our territory was water, as well as land. And so all of that that was ours, I, I maintain that it's still our territory, but that we don't have that we no longer have responsibility for. We, we only have this tiny little piece that's called the reservation. All of that, that we did have responsibility for, that we no longer have responsibility for, that was ceded, taken from us. That um, we've never been paid for and will never be paid for. Um, by virtue of that, we have paid our taxes in advance forever now that wasn't the deal we made that's the deal y'all made with us so when i'm at lowe's and ordering you know thousands of dollars worth of building supplies and having it delivered to my house and i give them my tax card i also give them three pieces of paper one that says this treaty by virtue of this treaty in the ceded lands, blah, 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 blah. We don't pay state and local taxes. And then, and so that's a letter from our chairman. And then behind it, there's a document that says, this person is a tribal member and she lives on the reservation. And then there's my ID. I give them those things and the materials are delivered and I don't pay tax. But boy, the burden of proof is all over you, isn't it? Yeah, and not all the stores will honor it. Um, we're not supposed to, like, like um, good luck getting getting, um, uh, what is it, um, the internet service provider, um, or the Verizon, or um, um, CenturyLink, good luck getting any of those to um, honor it. We've mailed it, we've faxed it, we've hand delivered it, we've notarized it, we've registered, mailed it, and um, they still don't, they still won't. But then there's all kinds of other little mom and pop stores that do, you know? So um, 
We have a comment from Sheila. Sheila, do you want to say it yourself? Unmute. I don't know if she's still there or not. Yeah. Uh, there she goes. Um, I just wanted to thank you, Barbara, for this. It's fun to, fun to hear you talk because I know you and it's fun to hear, hear your lovely voice. Um, I just wanted to, you know, I just wanted to say that when you talked about the two games, I remember that just brought back those wonderful memories of you uh, working with us for the uh, museum. Um, oh yeah. Museum camp, uh, camp days, do you remember that? Oh, well, I love those camp days. Oh, they were wonderful. It's such fun and the kids learn so much from you. Yeah. It was so it was wonderful. Thank you again, though. Thank you for that. Thank you for this. Thank you for the next one that you do. <laughs> oh, and I just want to say important. that when we talked about this topic, Barbara said, oh, I don't think I could talk for more than about 10 minutes about the museum. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like, you don't know how much you know. You are such a, an amazing historian and you have so much uh, information and history all in your amazing brain. It's like those. It's like, it's like like those elders that you were talking about earlier. You have to start. You have to look at the picture, and then the story comes out. Well, so I have to say, the new Suquamish Museum is located where it's located because still, um, still, in all the years that the Suquamish, the first Suquamish Museum was here on Sandy Hook, people could find Chief Seattle's grave and not find the museum. So when there was the ability to make the new Suquamish Museum, we put it as close to Chief Seattle's grave as possible so that people would find it. Because people, again, from around the world would make their way to Chief Seattle's grave and never find the tribe or an Indian. So, um, so the new Suquamish Museum is where it is because of that. Well, and one time you offered us a personal tour. Yes. And I'm, we're gonna put together another Suquamish um, Museum visit for the senior center probably next year because we're scheduling out but and I'm gonna try to hold you to that so that yes. you could be our personal guide on that day it would be awesome to get your um to have your your walking tour because I, I know you've I got insist, a million stories I, I, I insist I want to be your your guide great thank you Becky I just I just want to say thank you for very much for this talk which I've really enjoyed and also just that I love that museum. I, I was never in the old museum, but the new museum, I think it's just so lovely and so well done. And I love taking visitors there. And it, I feel like it also, did, because it gives them such an important perspective on this area and it's, and it's you know, it's history and what it is today. Yeah. Have, so, have you been you. there since we built our new um, legacy playground right beside it? Mm -hmm. Um, I think I've seen that. I've been there pretty recently. When was the playground built? So, um, it, it, com it was completed during the pandemic. And so, um, yeah. that, that, um, Legacy Park is what it's called. And, um, and it, it has, um, diff it has three different components that are built around legends, around stories, of, um, oh. like how Blue Jay saved daylight and, and the basket ogress. So, um, so there's a, and then there's the killer whales there for kids to play on. And yeah, yeah. So I think I've seen that. I haven't explored it, but I have to, yeah. Bring your kids or your grandkids. Right. You come so that they can play in the playground. It's beautiful. It's really yeah. beautiful. Thanks.